Taco Tuesday, it's Taco Tuesday. Come on. Taco Tuesday, it's Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday, it's Taco Tuesday. Another edition of the Taco Tuesday.com podcast. I'm your host, Corey. We have our guest host, Crawford. The best seats. Yes, sir. Back. We are pleased to announce that we have our special guest, Will Blackman. He is a 12 year NFL veteran and he is the founder of the Wine MVP. Yes, sir. Thanks no, for coming on, man. No, awesome. That's, that's such a, like a juxtaposition there. Just <laughs> football in Psalm. Super Bowl winning football, should Super mention. Bowl. For all you Patriots fans out there, well, you, you probably know, know I, I have to be nice to the Patriots fan. I'm from New England, so, you know, it's no harm, no foul. Right. Yeah. <laughs> My friends rooted for me, but not the Giants in that game. So it was all good. <laughs> they did quietly. They're like, yeah, yeah. Like, hey, you did great, man. Yeah. Uh, so today we have uh, Chella's Mexican Kitchen. Carla was nice enough to bring in this awesome spread for Beyond us Beyond nice enough. Yep. yep. We love her for it. Uh, we have some new <laughs> Melissa's Produce Hatch Hot Sauces. Excited to give those a try. Let's get into it. Let's All right. It. Yeah. Play it up and then we'll go. Yeah. So how do you go from, I read that you were always Oh, wait, to, wait. Before wait, I whoa. do this, guys, we, we got to start off with some bubbles. That's true. Because we okay, don't yeah, just let's, have let's let's tacos get to the important, today. Let's stuff, get to the important yeah. stuff. No, you, <laughs> I'll open it as you, as you go. Now, here's the trick, though. No, it's about to be wine ASMR right now. I know. I messed up. <laughs> I should explain it. But when you, I'm taught, I know like champagne, you pop it, go crazy, have fun. But let me go first. We have uh, Triana here from Austin Hope. Actually, Triana is the is the main brand of the Austin Hope uh, family wines. And this is their sparkling wine, Blanc de Blanc. So obviously all white grapes. And so what I was taught is when you have the gauge, you want it's six turns. Right. And it opens up, right? You all should know six mm-hmm. turns and keep it away from people when you open it. And the trick is try to open it quietly, which is super, yep. super difficult. And I will try my best <laughs> to. There we go. No pop. I, I've actually never first. seen that happen. It's true. You're I've actually never not seen a champagne bottle it. open without the pop. Live. I on didn't set. know. Live on set. <laughs> yeah, let's start. Off. So yeah, what you were saying? Sorry, let me. <laughs> Well, I guess yeah, let's I let's can, dive into it kind of why while we're, well, oh, while we're pouring and talking. I mean, this is kind of part of what you do and kind of what we're going to talk about today is the wine MVP, which people may not know is most valuable palette, as you've said before. And so, yeah. So this is basically kind of something that you do do. So I guess the main thing we should do before we unpack everything else is what is wine MVP and kind of what is the service that you provide? Well, cheers. Thanks. For cheers. 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 Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah. So. So the, the wine MVP is interesting. I um, I know super sick. My mouth just watered. <laughs> when, when I was in Green Bay, first team I got drafted to, I was there from 2006 2010. I was already kind of I was already into wine. I enjoyed it, and I was a novice consumer. So I liked you know sweet wines, and I like red fruity blends. Right. I think I used to crush like Menage a Trois that that red yeah, wine. I used to just go, you know, that was my go-to. But it was interesting because we also signed Charles Woodson uh, to our team, yeah. and he's someone I admired in college. You know, he was one of my favorite players then, and I watched him in the NFL as well. And I found out quickly that he had his own wine. And for me, this is 2006. You know, so he was one of the early guys in terms of like the the modern athlete winemaker stuff. And it was cool to see. Uh, prefer, not just a professional athlete, but African American guy in in that space. Because for me, I'm thinking like I have to be, you know, I have to have a wine background, maybe be in a wine family to even start. Because I'm like, how do you even get into the wine space? So to see that was really cool. And the one thing he did that was fun is that we were every away game he would take us out to dinner. So we go to a really nice restaurant. He would order all this wine for us, and so it was it was such a cool experience to to see. Now I always say he had an unfair advantage because when he played for the Raiders, they were in Oakland and they had training camp in Napa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. like training camp in Napa, like that would be dreamy to have training camp. In, oh yeah, to be there for a whole a whole summer? Are you kidding me? Right before harvest. Um, so I just got super interested and in, and in more curious uh, when it came to that, and so I just started studying, researching. And and trying to learn this on my own, which, you know, if you get into the wine space, that's a beast to try to learn by yourself. 100%. Oh, yeah. And it was it was pretty cool to do that. And then I, I would go to Milwaukee a lot, you know, which is about, a, I think, an hour and a half drive from, from Green Bay. And I would hang out with these, like, real estate moguls that enjoyed the most expensive, craziest-ass wines I've ever seen. 
And I remember these guys just going on and on about Burgundy, like Burgundy's the best, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at what they're ordering. It's like 2000 3000 I'm like, this is crazy to be spending this much money on wine. <laughs> like, I just want my Gerstamina, you know, like I'm cool with that. Um, oh, and I used to crush, I crushed a lot of beer in Green Bay. That's, well, oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I was, your A-deuce. I, was, yeah. I was 21 years old drinking Guinness. Like, I was a monster. I like, think everybody <laughs> has like a Guinness phase too. Everybody <laughs> goes through a phase where they drink a ton of Guinness. No doubt yeah. about it. And, um... So, yeah, I, I started listening to these guys. And one of my – the reason I'm going to the story because I'll tell you that's what is going to get to where we are now. And I remember I was a big lone diner. So I would go to restaurants like a food critic and um, just learn about whatever. Just let me sit back, give me the experience, and let's go. And so I remember I go to this one restaurant, and I'm thinking to myself, these guys are bragging about this burgundy. I'm going to find this damn burgundy. Keep in mind, I think burgundy is a brand. I didn't know it was a region. Right. So, so I go to the wine list and I'm like, damn, bro, they make a lot of burgundy, you know, like this, <laughs> this company does. So I order the wine and then the, uh, the Psalm, uh, brings me the wine and I look at it and it looks just like this. I'm like, I'm like, dude, this ain't burgundy. Yeah. He was like, yes, it is. I was like, no, the F is not. <laughs> and he's like, he's a, like, why is it not burgundy? I said, because it's white. And he was like, all right, Mr. Blackman. And it was funny in Wisconsin because big Packer town, they knew all of us. They had rosters like under yeah. the host table. Like they knew who we were. And he explained to me, you know, Burgundy's region, Peter Noir or Chardonnay. And that really like blew my mind. So I was like, okay, how can I learn more about this? And then that's when I started watching documentaries and shows and stuff like that. And that's when I finally saw Psalm, you know, the documentary of the, of the guys training for the master sommelier. And I was like, I need to find a, a class like that. Cause that would just help me just know more. And one off season, I decided to go and take the WSET. Um, I, I have to say the whole acronym because I went to I actually went to the WSET headquarters in London and I said W set and they almost threw me out the building. <laughs> I, <laughs> so, I, yeah. I say, say WSET too. Yeah, yeah, I said, whole, so I, once I took that, I just went and took level two, passed that with the merit and that just rocked my world. Um, and then fast forwarding, I was like, I want to get into this wine space and Everyone I spoke to was like, yeah, you can make wine, but it's, it's a beast unless you want to lose money or unless you have it or whatever it is. And I thought like, you know what, if I took my whole network in sports entertainment and married it with my network in the wine space, culinary wine space, that would be super cool. So I was like, man, the wine AVP, like that, that it's, I almost used like a football acronym. I said like NFL wine guy. And then I'm like, I'm sure I'm going to have to speak to the NFL about the acronym. <laughs> like, Roger NFL, Goodell would like a which word. Which actually might not be a bad <laughs> idea if I get that licensing with them, you know. Um, but yeah, the wine MVP was like perfect. This is for me to share my wine journey with everyone. Because for me, like when it comes to wine, I'm big on the, I like information versus like, you know, you know, pinky up and spending a, a ton on wine. Like I just like information, the nerdy stuff. So that's, that's how the wine MVP w was born, pretty much. I know I gave you the whole beginning, but <laughs> nah, man, that's what this <laughs> that's is what here we for. Were yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so yeah. when people look into the wine MVP, right. it, it's not just you kind of sharing your education. I mean, you do like tastings, like it is yeah. a wine club, kind of for right. you know, lack of a better description of it, kind of, and that's why we have bottles here today, and we're kind of tasting through. You're kind of using your expertise, your network, not just kind of within sports and stuff, but within winery, in this instance, now to share basically different bottles and different flavors with people. Is that right? Yeah. The, the, the biggest thing I'm trying to do is just help elevate like the wine experience, you know, and just, again, it's taking them on a journey with me. You know, this isn't a condescending type of lecture. Like, Hey, this is what I know. This is what you need to do. Here's all the rules. Um, if you want a great experience in terms of enjoying wine, sure. There are perfect pairings. There are certain things. Like if I see someone, you know, with a, piece of halibut and they want a big ass cab i'm like go for it <laughs> you know I'm like, you know if, if that's what you enjoy so be it but it's really to try to elevate wine experiences for people because right you know it's already been documented across where wine is super intimidating and people don't know whatever it is but how do we truly enjoy it and the in the best way that i know how is just to share it you know to help teach and just let people know like i had these vulnerabilities like i didn't i didn't know about the tannins i didn't know about acidity yeah. you know um i know like you said, i mean you thought burgundy was a brand there's someone out there probably like saying. you're yeah. like man these people at marlboro a make a lot of wine yeah. no like, this dude's, <laughs> i thought it was just a color you know I'm like, right like nah it's a and right even like that like france you you must know it's silly but you have to know what that region produces yeah 
Otherwise, you have no idea what's going on. Right. So uh, that's the thing is, is to really just, again, just elevate uh, wine experiences, whether it's tastings, whether it's trips, whether it's, it's events, whether it's through the wine club. Like in the wine club, you'll see when we go through the what I brought today, there's wines that nobody will really buy, you know, because it's like I don't recognize these things. So I'm big on the the history. I'm big on geography. I'm big on the viticulture. And, and that that's how it was for me with football. I'm massive, diehard in love with football in terms of like a historian. Like I can... I can rattle things off that happened before I was born when it comes to football because I grew up watching these old films and tapes. So the same way I found love football is the same way my journey is with wine. I mean, that's cool. I don't know. I'm like a history nerd and like I love studying the world wars. and Right. You know, yeah. It's, but that's but a big part I, when it comes to wine. Like, like there's so many things like that in the quick story. I didn't mean to cut you off. A uh, quick story. No, you're good. So one of my teammates, when I played for the Washington, now Commanders, used to be the Redskins, he like six, seven guy. And he called me and he was like, man, like everyone's, I like Moscato, but people are making fun of me for drinking Moscato. They're like, that's not a manly drink. You know, you know, I'm like, first of all, Moscato is good as hell. You know, I said, secondly, um, you can tell them that when our troops were in Italy, uh, when they came back, there was a huge spike in Moscato consumption because yeah. that's what they were drinking over there. I said, so people died for Moscato, okay? Like they <laughs> they went for it, and he just and it was. I just tried to find something to make him laugh, but it, it was true. I was like, man, it's just it's just wine. So um, that's perfect. I'm glad you're here because you get to fact check me on that. There you go. Yeah, no, it's there, <laughs> I read one kind of funny story about that. The guys that went over in Italy, the airborne troops, um, yeah, when they yeah. came back. That had a big boom in America with like Italian food yeah. culture uh -huh. because they came home and they were telling everybody that they knew about all the delicious food they had in Italy. Like, you don't understand the, the pasta over there is different. Everything is different. <laughs> right. The tomatoes are different. Yeah. You don't get it. Yes. But uh, yeah, that kind of had a big boom in like the mid to late 50s or 40s mm. for people eating Italian food here. So very cool, man. Yeah. I'm huge into pairings. I'm. Th this is kind of fun for us having a wine person on because I'm big in wine. I do a lot of wine kind of writing and on my own podcast, right. I've interviewed wine people and winemakers. And I know Corey's not a big wine guy. So we're almost kind of a great focus group of kind of what your service and kind of what your knowledge right. does because you can bring in somebody like myself that knows at least a little bit of what they're talking about or can at least BS enough around to show that they can yeah and then you're kind of think most just, of us kind of do it's fine yeah most of us kind of do because there's too much to know <laughs> even you know even people bring on bring me on to stuff like expertise i'm like again it's i feel like wine is is like a you know like being a doctor or practice you know because you're always learning every every year event is a different vintage well i was gonna say what is harder to learn about wine and learning about wine or memorizing a playbook oh my wine yeah, <laughs> wine. yeah. <laughs> that wasn't even a question yeah, yeah. Be well because <laughs> Uh, how can I say this? The, there's so much uh, science and, and like chemistry and, and all kinds of stuff when it comes to the wine, like at least like in football, there's a, there's a base where I like, okay, this, this works, or there might be different variations of one play. Like it can be a cover three where guys just, zone up and spot drop it can be a cover three match where it's like yeah you kind of zones but you are matching someone in your area so i don't know football is my world so that's hard for me to answer <laughs> yeah, no, I did, using the analogies is great i love it i did want to ask you uh you know you're a young guy you won a super bowl yep. you're a som you know you clearly like you strike me as the type of guy you go into something and you're not going to give something less than 110 percent. you know like how i guess i don't know how to frame the question but uh have you, have you always been the kind of guy that just goes into everything that you do 110%? Like, did you try all the things that you didn't like before you went into football? Or did you know as soon as yeah. you played football, you knew you loved it? Well, football, yeah, for me, it was, it was instant. Um, the interesting thing about me as a kid was I never, I never really wrote down, like, I want to go to the NFL. You know, I didn't. First of all, I thought the NFL was impossible. Like yeah, I'm from kids from Providence, Rhode Island. I'm like, there's no one in my area that is an example where who has made a professional that I know of at the time. So for me, I just enjoyed playing. I just enjoyed competing. I just I enjoyed that part. Um, and I just I wasn't so much afraid to like to like mess up or, or fail. You know, now I did deal with a tragedy early. My my mother passed away when I was six years old, and I think dealing with something very young like that made me pretty resilient to, to any kind of like trauma or anything negative. So right. 
when in doubt, and, it's, and it's, it was interesting, after my mom passed away is when I signed up for flag football. I was about six years old. And I think in retrospect, it kind of became, you know, I hate using the word outlet, but I ended up, I was able to, despite what I was going in my life, I was able to still go play football and do well. And that carried out through like my entire career. So for me, it was just more so about the, the resiliency. You know, it's like, I'll go into something. It wasn't so much like I'm going to go in it 110%, 110% and go for it. It's like I'm going to go into something and you can keep like punching me. You can push me back. You can knock me down. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Right. Because that's that's the biggest thing, right? Is like a lot of us go into something with the intention of like, we're going to go 110%. But what happens when adversity hits? You know, what happens when it's not working out for you? Sure. Are you going to be like, you know what? Let me Let me look elsewhere. And so for me, the biggest thing is like, if I'm able to be passionate about something, then, then there's no stopping, you know, yeah. you're going to, it reminds me of the scene in like Terminator when T-1000 is like running after the car and he's getting shot at the whole time. <laughs> he's like, pow, pow. And like, this dude is still running to like slow him down. It's mm-hmm. the same thing like that. So, and I mean, there's, that's why to get into this wine space, it's, it's scary. It's crazy. You lose a bunch of money. You're, you're learning it's There's, there's no perfect formula to be successful at this. So I think playing football for 12 years, my journey was different. You know, I had, I've been on four teams. I had nine operations, lost nine. money, made money. Jeez. Oh yeah. Like it's just, I know a lot of guys after one operation, they're like, I'm done with this, Yeah, you know, but to just keep going, keep going, which allows me, I mean, I rebranded the wine MVP three times already, you know? And yeah. so, but anyhow. Yeah. I, I guess the point was like, it's, it's such a small percentage of people that go, they no play doubt. like yeah. a, they play football in high school. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then a small percentage get to go play at like a big university. Right. And that's like a small percentage and right. then a much smaller percentage gets scouted by some scout that's watching a game, you know, and then you get the, the offer to go play professional right. football. It's such a small percentage of people. That yeah, do that. It's, it's, it's hard. It's just the right timing, right? It's, you know, yeah. there's no, there's no one way how to do it. Yes. Yeah. You have guys that, you know, maybe played at a high level in California and then went to a high level school and then you're, you're, already, you're always around it. And you got people from me, I went to, you know, from Rhode Island or whatever. And then eventually found myself in a place where I was able to compete. So, right. Yeah. Let's get the um Chardonnay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. This was in our December club, I believe. Um so basically let me get into the wine club. This is this is, you know, what we launched this year. So I had a wine club previously. Uh big shout out to uh Wine Exchange of Santa Ana. They were they're they're a big part of my story. Um Patrick, uh, Kyle, uh and Tristan because they they allowed me to come to the shop um, every morning for like months and sit with when distributors would come in and I would just rip through like a hundred wines at like nine in the morning. Sit in on the tastings. <laughs> sit, yes. Yeah. I literally sat That's there awesome. and just got to go th- and my palate just grew, grew, grew. And it started with them because they really, this, this is so funny. So I was like, I need to go hang out at a wine shop. So uh, one of my neighbors, he knew, you know, Tristan and Kyle over at, wine exchange and he called them they're like yeah he can come in and hang out so i would just come in and just walk around and look at what people are buying and selling so it kind of got weird so he's like well you keep coming here like what do you what are you trying to do <laughs> i was like i'm trying to i'm trying to learn this whole wine space especially the retail spot so they let me hang out for a while go in there do the tastings and then we decided to just you know we partnered on a like a two bottle wine club and then it was it was super cool uh to start off in the beginning and then the partnership just ran its course. We had a, you know, a mutual split was still super cool friends and just had different visions. And then I just relaunched the wine club, um, this spring where I pick four bottles. Um, they're random for about, I literally sit here and do all the tasting and, and go through them. And I try to pick really weird, different wines from places you really wouldn't buy. And, I still try to be consumer friendly because some of them, they all make sure they all have pretty good scores. I know people care about that. Um, for me, it doesn't really matter, but I know it does for people just to have some, I guess, to be valid in, in their in their eyes. But so that's what happened with the wine club. So we have some Piatelli from uh, Mendoza. It's a Chardonnay. Um, and it's, I think it's super rocking. Again, I love finding Chardonnay from like different places just to, just to see. And obviously what uh, Mendoza in certain areas has got the elevation. So, you know, again, I love, for me, I love 
acidity like when it comes to wine and it, it's so funny again with the the nerdy stuff because i remember i would be in tasting and the guys are like oh man this wine has a great acid great acidity i'm like how the f do you know that like we're like how, how are you measuring acidity and i'm like what is that you know and uh me i think like pasta when i get like heartburn like that's acidity to me you know yeah, me and, too when i get heartburn yeah, yeah. You know, so i'm like that's acidity <laughs> but it was the uh, as you know it's when your mouth waters like mm -hmm. that's how you can that's how you measure it like how much is the water is the water a little bit and it's low medium high and i when i do tastings i always be like when i look at a a bag of like sour patch kids and my glands start watering I'm like that's the acidity and people are like oh my like, yeah it's the mouth watering that's acidity so interesting i actually didn't know that yeah so that's what i do like so this is this is really really cool um a, a really cool a female winemaker so when i think of mendoza i think of uh, Lara Catena, you know, she's someone that I, I think she's badass. She's a went to Harvard doctor and winemaker. I don't know how she does it, uh, <laughs> but uh, really cool. So yeah, and this will be perfect. Uh, we have the uh, the fish taco here, and I also have the chicken. So you know, try to pair it with a cig. Let me throw a lime in there. Ooh, yeah, really, yeah, really, too, really yeah. rock with the acidity. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> I let's think when this. people like think about wine and they think about wine pairings, more often than not, they go to like. You know, you you go for some of those big Italian reds when you do an Italian right. food. You know, with you know the Barolos and things, the County obviously that everybody runs to. People think classic French or things like that. If you're talking right. about Rhone varietals, but I mean, I was lucky enough in I can say this now because it's January, but last year, 2023, I went on a press trip down to Valle de Guadalupe and checked out Mexico's wine country. And I mean, the wines are first of all astounding. But anybody who, again, Taco Tuesday podcast, who doesn't right. love this type of food? I think it pairs phenomenally well together. I mean, wine and Mexican food really goes well together. But from a pairing aspect for you, do you believe in kind of some of those rules earlier? I mean, you were talking about if somebody orders right. halibut, go ahead and get that big old cab. I mean, I'm kind of a believer of that. I'm like, drink what you want right. in a way. Yeah. Where does that fall for you? For me. And then I'm going to try the Chardonnay. Yeah. Look, I was waiting for you guys to crush the uh, Blanc de Blanc. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I did that a little bit ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me know what you think here. Thank you. Yeah. So, this so is, Valeria Ant oh. Antonolin is the uh, female winemaker here. Um, so, yeah, I, I think truly it comes down to the experience you're looking for. If you really want the full experience when it comes to the pairing, you know, then <clears throat> sure, you get a ribeye. That's fat, awesome. You get a fatty ribeye and you want a, a wine where it doesn't become too astringent. So you get obviously a, you know, a wine with a lot of tannins. We always mentioned a big cab because then it cuts through. And it softens the tannins in the red wine. You know, I always look for, okay, this, this Chardonnay, a lot of acidity. So I match acidity with acidity, you know. Um, when in doubt for me, I always look for, I, I try to marry the, the weight, right? You get a big, bold, hearty, full dish and you try to match it with a big, bold, hearty, full wine, you know. Right. So, but yeah. The pairing is key, again, if you want to elevate the experience when it comes to the wine. But sometimes I might have a rosé and I drink rosé with everything. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what so I'll no do. no shame in that game There's at no all. no shame in that game, yeah. So, no. yeah, like right now I, I'm doing the fish taco um, with the, uh, you know, the pico de gallo, the cabbage. And my, you know, just looking at it alone, the acidity. So I think it. Yeah, I think no, that has a really nice acidity to it. I like that a lot. That's really solid. And again, and, and you're kind of pointing, I mean, acidity for the most part, correct me if I'm wrong, that's kind of like the sides of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah, that's where you I really need to correct you. That. You know this stuff. That's solid. <laughs> uh, the NFL is a very, very small fraternity. Very small. We already kind of touched on that. I mean, it's a very limited club that you guys have worked your entire lives yeah. to get to. And I mean, what an amazing thing to be a part of. Inevitably, there will be life after football. Right. Which I think can come as a harsh reality for some people. It kind for of sneaks everyone. up on other so people. Some people it's unexpected. Yeah. For everyone. Not everybody is going to make that move to be, you know, in the commentating booth and things like that. What is it like for you when you talk to former teammates and friends of yours that are either still in the league or out of the league and they're kind of like, hey, what are you doing now that you're not balling out anymore? Right. And they kind of hear what you're doing. This is a, this is an ongoing topic forever. And for me, football is the only thing I want to do. Period. I, I didn't think about plan B. I didn't think about anything. It was like football. Even when I went, to, I went to Boston College and I decided to major in English. But then by my junior year, I was like, bro, I'm majoring in football. Like this is this is my my degree. 
And because it's such a small window, it's super hard. You literally, you pour everything into it. Otherwise, if, I feel like if you, if you don't, or if you are, you take it for granted, like it's easy to get out the leak. So the scariest thing is part two, because there's, there's nothing, there is nothing like the NFL, nothing when you leave, especially if that's all you did. So that was a huge adjustment for me. Sure. I, you know, I can do whatever, well-rounded, big network, you know, have my degree, all these cool things, but the, I didn't, the scariest thing was, was to leave. Cause it's like, well, well now what, you know, if you think about this, I played football from ages six to 36 years old. My whole life has been scheduled regimented. Yeah. I knew, I knew what tomorrow was. I knew who we play next week. I knew who we're playing in two months from now. I knew when the season was over, when I had to be back. I knew when training camp was OTAs. I, our schedule came out. Our opponents actually came out mid season. Like I think mid season of the current season schedule comes out in April. So I like, I just knew everything when I was done. I'm like, shoot, I got to make my own schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to make one schedule. I have to get up. Like I have to get a routine. I worked out because I had to work out, right? My body was my business. Now I'm, I'm trying to find like a routine way to sustain shit. We spoke, we spoke before the, the pod is like, I just, I had to make it a lifestyle because literally I'm working out n not for a game. I'm working out to make sure like my clothes still fit, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> to make sure my body doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure I, I feel good and, and have a healthy life to be with my wife and kids, you know, stuff like that. So, um, I, I know so many guys where they've made, you know, five X what I made and just struggling because it's like, well, what's the purpose now? Sure. They may have, they may have a lot of money, may have investments, may have really cool things they're doing. They may have like cool things outside that's there, but something is, is missing for them. They are probably doing things cause they can afford it or doing things that they like, like, what are you willing to do where you're super passionate and you're like, man, win or lose, I'm passionate about it. So I'm going for it, you know? Right. So it, it's the struggle and we all talk about it. We all try to help each other. Uh, I'm a big resource for guys. Um, cause they look at me, they're like, man, he seems cool. He's enjoying it. Like he doesn't look like he's having any issues, but I have a lot of dark days. I have a ton of, of dark days where it's like, man, this is, you know, I, I miss it. You yeah. know, if, if I could be, I would, I would still be playing. Yeah. You know? And um, you know, people, I know a lot of guys like, man, I'm, I'm happy to be done. I missed the camaraderie. I missed being on the battlefield. Like that's, yeah. that's what I love. I love being there. So it is a constant struggle. It's a constant battle every day. Now I'm, I'm fortunate where I have people in my corner, you know, my wife, Shauna, she is absolute machine. You know, she's positive every single day. She wakes up with good energy. She's never Debbie Donner, she's like, like, get your ass up type of person. You know, our daughter is, is she wakes up every day happy. And our son, he's just a walking unicorn. Like he's just, a, he's a different, <laughs> different kid, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm fortunate to have that where I look at a lot of guys, they don't have any of that. Yeah. You know, they may have kids, but don't, don't see them. You know, they may have a, a spouse who's like, man, our life is different. You know, come on, help fix this situation. Um, so I have a lot of support from key people in my life that helps me because when I see them, I'm like, okay, like, like, let's go. And especially like being a, being a parent, you know, and a husband is like, man, now I have more days to dedicate to them. You know, I got two kids in the house where being involved is, is, is crucial. You know, our son is 13 years old. That is a, that is a vulnerable stage where he can go left or right. Yep. You know, very pivotal. Yeah, time very pivotal. So for me to be there and continue to install like all these characteristics and details in him is huge. But a lot of guys can't see it because, again, those dark days and, and this is anyone like those dark days really blind, you know, the purpose, what, you, what you're trying to yeah. do, you know. So it's it, it's it's a, like I said, it's an everyday battle. But we spoke earlier about resilience. You know, if something yep. if you, if you want to go for it, go for it. I saw I'm not a big like quote person. Like, you know, I see, you see all this motivation stuff on social media and sometimes I'm just like, okay, you know, like, are you, are like you, are I'm, you, I'm pumped up enough today. Yeah, yeah I know. Like, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> are you really like, does this work for people? Yeah, you guys, you or, read this little, little no, thing, but are you really, are you really living that life where you're just like motivating to like get clicks, yeah. you know, cause you probably did this video in five minutes or whatever. And you go back to your, 
whatever, miserable life. Mm -hmm. But I saw a quote from Kevin Hart and he talked about, he said, it's easy to give up, right? Do something, it doesn't work, give up. He said, what's hard is to mention, give 110% on something and it doesn't work out. He said, what's hard is to get up the next day, give 110% and it doesn't work. And then to keep doing that, to get up again the next day, give your all and nothing works out. He said, that is the, that's the real grind because you, you have faith that eventually one day it will happen, but you're psychotic enough to get up and <laughs> seriously, just, again. just keep going. You know, I always think of that, that famous picture of the guy with the pickaxe, right? And he's like right there and he walks away. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And the yeah. other guy is like plowing the through other it. Side, yeah, yeah. He's like plowing through it. Like, okay, we're almost there because there was a point where when I was doing this whole wine deal, especially during uh, the pandemic, where when I started off, it was like, boom, I was in wine spectator. Boom, w, uh, USA Today, front page, like Stan Kroenke call, Shot to Lafitte call. Everybody was calling because I was, you know, it's a, it's a global paper. Mm -hmm. I was in, you know, Vine Pair. I was wine enthusiast, 40 under 40, like just crushing. And then all of a sudden I hit a plateau and no money's coming in. You know, I just retired. So our burn rate is pretty high. So like nothing's going, nothing's going on. I'm over here like, oh my gosh, like this is this is crazy. I said, but I, I still like, I still believe like this is, this is good. And mm -hmm. again, I don't have family members looking at me. My wife not looking at me sideways. Like this better work out. She's like, hey, if you think it's going to work out, like let's rock, like yeah. let's go for it. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, cause the one thing she's, she's not a dream killer, which I, you know, I appreciate. And then all of a sudden something hit, I got a really cool, uh, partnership for, you know, you know, X amount of dollars that end up being really cool and continue to elevate to, to where I'm going. So, um, and then I think what also helps too is, is for me is I, I understand that battle. So anything I do, uh, I come in this space with like no ego, you know, I think, I think this space is where we all can win. There's something for everybody. You know, we all can have our own wine project and still get along and still make our own money and then even find ways to work together. Yeah. Yep. You know, so, yeah, that's a, that's a, I think about that every day, that question in terms of just purpose after that is, like I said, it's like taking the hamster off the wheel because that's, that's all I knew, you know, remember that, remember when LeBron, the lady told him to shut up and dribble and then everybody yeah, came yeah, out with yeah. the whole thing. Um, Somebody LeBron told said LeBron to he, shut up and dribble. Yeah, the, I'm, <laughs> Yikes, yeah, yeah. But he came up with this whole thing called more than an athlete. Like he said, I'm more than an athlete because I have all these investments, all these businesses. Like if basketball stopped today, like I'm good. And it was really cool because it really inspired a lot of guys to think outside of their own sport, have a different identity. Because what if football ends or your sport ends? Then where are you? But for me, I didn't want to be anything else. I was all football period like that was it so when it ended for me it was tough it was super tough but again the, su the support system is key and that's that's for anybody i don't care what you're doing i don't care if you you know work at a fast food restaurant you know support is key because that's yep. a tough job yeah you know so that is a beast man that's why a lot of guys they yeah, they, no they they find other things that throw them off and and mess them up yeah, well, I mean, a lot of, I'm probably the vast majority of people, they go, they do things when they're motivated to do things, but that's when discipline is the absolute key to success. Because, like, if you if you only do things when you're motivated, you're going to bust your ass about 10% of the time. Then the other 90% is just, oh, I wasn't really feeling it. I woke up cold. I'm tired of whatever, right, what yeah. have you. But discipline is, it's just knowing that you're not going to have that motivation every day. Right. You're going to have to get up and you're going to fail a lot most of the time. Right. You know, you're going to keep trying until something sticks no and question it, you know it works yeah it's like baseball is a failure sport right you bat 300 you're in the hall of fame yep <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy like you thought we talked about discipline i woke up this morning i'm like gosh it's cold i don't feel like going for a run today yeah <laughs> like i'm not going. yeah like it, <laughs> even just like getting up because i like to work out yeah before i go to work i need i have to like get my day so i have to like make my bed i have to go to the gym i have to do a couple things because so you come here and you things. eat all this and we and eat, then i come yeah. here and i'm like drinking tequila <laughs> on wine and hey you know eating tacos and all that but uh, work totally just lost my train. oh yeah so i go i go early in the morning just to like do one thing right and i'm very 
I have to live by my routine. We were talking about routines right. earlier. I have to have my routine every day, and I never break it. And when I do, I get grumpy. I'm like an old man in that sense. My grandfather's name was Mike, and my family and all my friends, my nickname from them is Millennial Mike. Because I can't, I can't, don't ask me to go out at 8 p.m. and go drinking or do things like that. I'm not going to do it. I have to be in bed by 9. I got to do all these things. Right. Um, but, like, I never, I never wake up in the morning at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, it's 41 degrees outside. I don't walk out the door and think, man, this is... But that, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm going to go. That works for some people. Yeah. Like me, you'll you will never never catch me on social media doing a cold plunge ever. Nope. Ever. It works for some people. <laughs> I didn't do it when I played, <laughs> let alone yeah. do it for for like for that, but but the the cool thing with the mind is constantly training it like like a, a muscle. You know, you constantly train and I find things like you mentioned making the bed. That was a game changer for me. Yep. Because it's my first deed of the day. I get up, I make the bed. All right, let's rock. Like it's time to go. Like I make it all the time just because it's my it's my good deed. I um I read a book. Um I think it was, gosh, I just not outliers because that was a, an athletic book. Um it was um God, I think it was like when there's a it sucks. I gotta find it. Anyhow, it just talked oh, it's willpower. Hello. Okay. Man, Will. Mm -hmm. It's called it's called Willpower. <laughs> I know. It's called Willpower. And and it's funny how I, f I found this book because I was playing for the uh, the Jaguars at the time and I sometimes I'll just go in the Barnes and Noble for the heck of it. Like I'll just go and st stroll around. Dude, I love Barnes and Noble. <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect. I'm there all the time. It's man. such a cool vibe though. <laughs> yeah. like, everyone's there with the same mindset. Like you're in Barnes and Noble for a reason. Yeah. You either get a book or a coffee or you're just doing homework or something like that. Yep. Or research. So I I go to the I guess the use it's not a psychology section, but I forget what it is. Um, so I found this, I look, I grabbed this book called Willpower and I opened the first page and there's a $20 bill in it. And this guy is like, I'm paying this for it. I hope you enjoy this book as much as I have. I was like, well, damn, I got to buy this book now. Yeah. And the guy put a 20 in it for someone else to get the book. So mm -hmm. I buy this book and I don't read this book for like three years. Right. Again, plan A is active. All is good. Life is good. I'm not tripping. And so I find once I was done, I finally decided to read this book and it was, it was super interesting just on not just that, but wordplay. And I also, what I dealt with a lot of injuries, I also met with a, a mental performance coach to, he trained my subconscious. I lost a lot of confidence when I got hurt yeah. and he helped retrain my subconscious, even things like, you know, like you said, I have to make my bed. I have to do this stuff. And then he was like, look, just start seeing, I get to mm -hmm. like, say I get to because it takes all that stress off. Now it's a, it's a privilege to get up and make my bed. I get to do this. I get to, you know, come and do the Taco Tuesday podcast. I get to do these things because it's cool. Because I like that. I'm bookmarking that. Yeah, absolutely. Because, no. Yeah, because if you have to, it puts a lot of stress. Because guess what happens if you don't make your bed, you forget to do it. You know, then you're like, damn it, like my day is is screwed. Where if you get to, and let's say, okay. I'm late for a meeting. I'll make my bed. It's all good. I'll come back and make my bed. Yep. You know, it's all good. And so that's the, even, <laughs> it, this is a funny example. Our daughter, she's nine and they have, uh, they do a mad dog math, which is like a timed math exam to teach you to like process quickly. So she was training with, um, with, <laughs> with her mom, with, our, with my wife. And I come home and she's like crying cause she failed five times in a row. And she's like, I don't want to do it again. I'm like, just, I said, listen, stress-free like it's all good i said the beauty is if you fail this time guess what she goes i get to do it again i said you can do it again <laughs> like you have another chance to do this so it's it's all good because if you fail like so what it happened like big deal and so she did it too much she did it one more time didn't didn't do well and then find the last time she did it she she has to answer i think like I think it's like 40 questions, math problems in like a minute. Mm -hmm. And so the last time she did it, she did it. And she finally finished it in, at home. So I picked her up from school yesterday and she was like, oh, she's like, I finished it with 10 seconds left. I'm like, nice. I was like, perfect. Like you, nice. you, she was, yeah, she was willing to go through it, mm -hmm. you know, because she took that stress off of herself. And even for me, it was, even when I played, like guys have specific routines, you know, and I didn't, I wasn't big on like superstition stuff. Like, yeah, I was, I was. Like that was certain times, but you know, let's say if I had a lucky rabbit foot and I, oh, I left it on the airplane. Yeah. I'm going to have a terrible game now. Like, no, you know, I yeah. had my best game on two hours of sleep 
I was stressed all night, like, oh my gosh, like I didn't sleep well, but I was pissed. I'm like, man, I was like, F it, here we go. <laughs> and I had a great game. <laughs> yeah, I had a great game. But um, but that was the thing too. My point was in this book, it was well with my uh his name is Jim Madrid. He actually lives, you know, here in SoCal. And he was just teaching me about training the subconscious mind. And and I was big on like visualization and journaling, but I never journaled. I would visualize it. And I started writing stuff down and started like really training my brain the whole week to get ready for our game. Um, again, to just train the subconscious. Like think if you're going to, if you're going to go buy a house, right? You're driving down the street and you see, you know, there's a McDonald's, there's a, you know, a Costco, there's all these stores, but the only thing you recognize are for sale signs. That's all you see because that is on your subconscious mind. You've been training and looking and researching. So that's all you see. You don't even see those buildings. You just see residential signs. And so I was able to train myself where it's like, I only see these plays. I only see these things. I'm able to, to harness that. Um, and then, so in this book, the willpower book, he was talking about um, like the, he was like the willpower is an energy bar, right? It's an energy bar. So anytime you do a good deed throughout the day, you keep that bar maxed out because there's going to be a point in that day where you're going to get tested. And if you don't have enough willpower, you're going to give in. Well, any kind of temptation, you're going to give into it. So when I get up and I don't make my bed, you know, that's, it, it takes away a bar. Yep. I get up and instead of having like a healthy breakfast, I have, you know, whatever, pizza or something, something that's not, not good. Then for my goal, again, it chips at my energy bar. I may be like, hey, it's all good. I have pizza, but it chips away. Uh -huh. And then if I just don't feel like working out, I'm like, ah, psh, whatever, it chips away. But then let's say, you know, there's a point later in the day where I'm trying to be productive. I don't have enough energy in my willpower to go do it. Because throughout the whole day, I chipped away at it. Yeah. Yep. Now, if I get up, make the bed, boom, do this, pray, all these things, and then I hit a vulnerable moment in the day, I got enough willpower in there to be like, Psh, like no big deal. Like, I already crushed it. It really is day. how it works, though. You yeah. achieve just these minor little yeah. things, and you yeah. stick to your yeah. structure. Yeah. So, But me having that awareness, I'll find ways to adjust to keep trying to restore it throughout the day. But it was, it was, that was for me, just that section was instantly fascinating I, I can go all day on the whole mindset thing like that's mm -hmm. that's, that's all the hell <laughs> I do. everything you live uh, yeah. in here your whole reality yeah, is like you, what you is. see out of these it eyes really and here with these ears well i mean speaking of commitment to bring it back to tacos and wine <clears throat> and football is we're recording this january 18th depending on when people are watching this we got the super bowl coming up i mean if we're going to talk football let's talk football and i want to get your thoughts on the super bowl and potentially you know, who could be in, who could be out, et cetera, because it's not every day you get to sit down with an NFL vet. But I want to do something, and I've been thinking about this kind of on and off throughout the episode. How many, we, we, what, we got wild card coming up this weekend still? No. Divisional. Divisional, that's right. So we got how many teams? I'm not looking. <laughs> I'm like, what do you got? You guys are looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, football's um, you don't kick it, right? I don't know. All right, how about this? You know these, you, I mean, you know these right. franchises, you know, I mean, I'm assuming presumably some of these guys that might even still be balling out. I want to, I want you to take the teams that are remaining and associate each team with a varietal. You know what? <laughs> Buffalo Bills don't get to be Len Brusco, but we're going something. But. No. <laughs> so I did this. It's in my notes. Of each uh, each NFL team, like paired with a wine. Oh my gosh, where is it? Because I had a friend that did this for cocktails, but I'd be curious to get your take on wine. Dude, what kind of mind reading with that? You ask the question, he's got a list on his phone. He's like, "Oh, let me tell you what I think about that." <laughs> they, 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 they don't know what happened before we hit record. Yeah. They don't know. They're just so, watching and enjoying, and we thank you. I did this before divisional, so I said the Ravens are a Napa Cab, Baltimore Ravens, because they are bold. They are brash, high alcohol. You, the, a yeah. lot of people, they're super popular. A lot of people love them, but there's a certain people that kind of like, ah, I'm over it. Like they need a, they need, but they're, but they're still a, a global favorite. You know, John Harbaugh is likable. Lamar Jackson is outstanding, super spicy. And then they have a, they're just swaggy and you know, their arrogance could rub people the wrong way. Snapper. <laughs> so true. Dolphins. I said they were champagne. 
um, exciting, explosive. Hashtag live on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> live on Sundays. Um, and also, too, every year when someone does not go undefeated, the 72 Dolphins pop champagne. Yeah. So I'm like, right. it, it just works because that was the last only only feeded team. The Chiefs, I said they were rosé um, because they a lot of, lot of finesse, right, offensively. Um, again, I said I drink rosé with everything, so very creative and a chameleon type of thing. And, like, who, you know, who, who doesn't like rosé? You know, I haven't met anyone. Yet. It's <laughs> you good know? stuff. Um, I said the Texans are Pinot Noir, USA. Oh, okay. USA Pinot Noir. Very likable. Um, like right now with CJ Stroud and, and D'Amico Ryan, they yeah. just, people just love them. And there's really not much to like dislike, you know, unless you're just, you're just not a fan, but Pinot Noir is very, very popular, uh, here, here in the, in the U S especially the fruit forward kind, the U S style. I said that the, um, uh, the Cleveland Browns Barolo, um, Ooh. Yeah, that's a sentence no one's ever said before. Yeah, super, super, <laughs> super just acquired. You know, if you just want your, you just want your your enamel and gums torn up, but like you still want a really good, you know, you know, tart strawberry type of wine, then I think Barolo it is because they would they just they just they didn't care. They just went after people, and it, it is what it is. Yeah. So uh, I said the <laughs> I said the Buffalo Bills, Viagne. Viognier um, for the Buffalo Bills. Buffalo, yes, <laughs> because you're like kind of like it. Because you're like you're, you're like what is this? Like what? Like what are they doing right now? Um, and and Viognier, people don't know it's, it's it's very aromatic, but being that it is a white wine, it is high in alcohol. So it's like you're confused, like trying to enjoy this wine, but you get that burn in your chest. You know, like okay, you're still getting well, like something is still going on here. You got a fuel's built. Yeah, I mean, Bill's Mafia got to fuel up. So. Yeah, no doubt about it. I said the Steelers are Chardonnay, um, and, I, and I say this because Chardonnay does well anywhere, any climate, any terroir, whatever it is, it does well. And every year the Steelers finish above 500. Like they are just constant. They're consistent. You know what you're going to get from Coach Tomlin. You know you're going to get this. They're very consistent to this day. Um, 49ers, I said that they're, they're Malbec. Um, just, again, another bold, but um, like just just very different, flexible um, but again, just, it goes with like big, you know, heavy, like meats and, and, and plus it's, it's always a party. I said the Cowboys, <laughs> San Giovese, <laughs> the, because you, you know, you see it in the glass and you're like, man, is this Pinot Noir? Is this Barolo? Is this San Giovese? Is this Beaujolais? You're like, what, like, what is, I don't know what's going on here. Um, but it's a d delicious wine. The lions are I said they're Zinfandel. Okay. And because for years, people just diss the Lions. Everyone disses Zinfandel. Like, oh, it's a cheap, high, high, you know, high alcohol, super ripe, you know, big, juicy yeah. wine. And, but, you know, Zinfandel's not going anywhere. And right now, the Lions aren't. I said the Bucks are a dry Riesling um, because... It's again for me. I think, especially here in the states, is it's a sneaky rock star that people don't really promote or celebrate that that much. You know, obviously globally it does well. Yeah. And the Bucks right now they're in divisional round and they're they're super sneaky and they're still holding down. I said the Eagles are a GSM blend, the Rams Sauvignon Blanc, and the Packers are Pinot Grigio. Nice. Just to solid. Up. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I had no. Now I want to say for the record, because people are watching, they're like, "No, they thought about this before." No, no idea. I was literally thinking about that during the episode. I, you just I happened was, to yeah, have no, that. Look, second look yeah, my like my, my notes right here say January seventh, and this is before you know. I think I booked it with, with Monet so yeah. and Pam. Perfect. So yeah, this awesome. was not planned, people. <laughs> <laughs> that was an excellent question. Jeez, it I mean, what, yeah. talk about intuition, man. Is, I'm just thinking about the. I just, it, yeah, those are some funny ones. If you had to, what would you do? And he's like, 
Well, I already did it. He's like, oh, yeah, I got you. Hold up. My yeah. list and I'm hold, tell hold, you. hold fast. I'll feed you, baby birds. Did you say the Raiders? Did you say what you thought They're the Raiders? They're not in the playoffs. They're not in the playoffs. Oh, okay, so it's just playoffs. That's why the, my, my, my dear Denver Broncos are a box Because I see a lot of the, the stereotypes about Raiders fans. They seem to really be true. I mean, they are a rowdy crowd of people. Mont- they are Mont- into it, man. Mont- Montepulciano. They are playing games. Montepulciano. It's the real deal. The Raiders might be a port. <laughs> you know what that's better yeah scratch that we're going with that yeah the port for sure oh my gosh i know it's a stereotypical question um but again whenever i'm on press trips like for wine stuff you're sitting around with wine people yep. what do you talk about you talk about wine mm-hmm. um people get to know each other like members of the media and we're always asking all right like you're stranded on a desert island you get to bring two varietals one red one white what are you bringing with you i'm bringing bubbles okay yep Rosé, like the Blanc, or Pinot Meunier. Ooh, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm all, yeah, if, look, if I'm going to, like, be by myself, I'm, I need to have fun. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> you know? No, but I don't want to, st- if I'm going to be on deserted island, everything is still, last thing I want is a still wine. Like, got to have something you know? exciting. You never know. Yeah. What if, like, someone's around, they hear me go, pop, like, I actually pop <laughs> yeah. it this time, you know? Yeah, forget the flare gun. Just <laughs> Yeah, just pop champagne. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, yeah, it's definitely champagne. This one here I had earlier champagne, uh, champagne method champagne wall. Yeah, that that is good stuff. Yeah. So, oh, so you already know this, but obviously it has to be called champagne if it's made in champagne, right? But I tell people, look for method champagne wall on the bottle. Look for traditional method. Look for these things because it's it's made the exact same way. It's just not in champagne. So right. if you're thinking like, oh, I'm trying to, you know, I don't want to spend fifty, sixty dollars on a champ- bottle of champagne. Well, just look for that method champagne wall or traditional method, you know, or even Cremant, you know, um, all made the exact same way. You know, ferment it in the bottle, pop it off, get some of the yeast off, add some dosage. <laughs> I know you were talking about when you opened the thing, you, yeah. were, you kept your thumb on the cork, right? right. When you were unscrewing right. the cage and everything. When I was on a cruise ship, we were sailing through the Greek Isles. I think we were like on our way to Mykonos or something. Uh-huh. And it was for my honeymoon. So they brought into our room like a little special bottle of champagne. And right. They must have shaken the thing or something. It's never happened to me before in my life. And I worked at a comedy club for 10 years. You're fine improv. I opened thousands of bottles of bubbly. You know, I've never taken off the cage and have a cork just yep. blast right out of the top of the bottle. Well, I'm sitting there, you know, right on the balcony in my room on the ship. There's a t- like 200 people below me sitting there, taking off the cage. I think I had about two more twists left. And the thing just, bam, all the bubbles are flying down, raining down on everyone. People are looking up at me. My wife looks over like, I told you to wait. I was going to film you open the bottle. I was like, I did not mean to do that. And then people below us started cheering. Woo! That's my a, point. They yeah. have no idea what's going on, but they were like, "Woo!" Like, I just rained down oh, champagne on people eating yes. breakfast. You know, yes. they should have been pissed. Okay, I feel like you, I would have been wait, pissed, but no, they were all. But like, you were on what? You on were a cruise on ship. a cruise ship, yeah. which is what very still. And you <laughs> yeah. popped champagne and brought the party on accident, but you brought the party. That's yeah, that's point. what I was thinking. You popped the bottle. Everyone's like, "Hey, what was that? That sounds like something I want to party." But yeah, but for that reason, that's why. Yeah, you have to keep your thumb on it and keep it. 45 degrees away from somebody. Yeah. Somewhere in the A, G, and C, there's just a, a champagne People cork react to a popping it. champagne cork the same way that my dog reacts to a squeak toy. All of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. they're like, where that? It's abrupt. Somewhere. It's abrupt. <laughs> it's like you go out to breakfast, and everyone's like, yo, I have a coffee. And somebody's like, oh, yeah, let's get a bottle of something. Okay. Very good. Fantastic. You know, I guess I'll be late for that meeting tomorrow. <laughs> Speaking of, let's move on. All right, man. What do we got next? All right, let's rock here. We got some De Stefani. We are, believe it or not, so this is a, uh, it's a Refusco. Nice. Um, so we are in Friuli, Venezia in Italy. And when, when I think of that region, I think Pinot Grigio, right? So you're like, damn, I got a red wine. Like, it's interesting. So it's weird. You, it looks like, tastes like a, you know, a Barolo or San Giovese. Um, a lot of, a lot of wood on this one. But this is interesting because, again, why do I think, why do I think uh, Pinot Grigio? Because it's like the top right. It's like the Achilles heel of Italy, right? Uh, near Austria. So it's mm-hmm. very cooler climate. A lot of rain over there. So you're thinking more uh, white wine, like like I said, Pinot Grigio. Uh, but no, they have this Refusco there. And the thing about this, though, obviously because of the weather, it's it's hard for it to ripen there. So 
Um, but there is obviously vineyard location and, and trying to get some aspect to the sun is, is the best way to do that. So uh, we have the Stefani Creta, which is clay, the soil, um, and it's reserver. So meaning that these are the riper grapes and longer uh, aging barrel. That's awesome. Yeah, super woody. There's my really geeky nice. stuff for you there. No, you sound so knowledgeable. <laughs> this is like me talking about wars and history with any of my people. They yeah. all just stare at me with a blank face. Yeah, I love and that. it's cool. So I didn't I didn't mention it earlier, but in the in the wine club, like you get these cool like tasting notes that I made here. Mm-hmm. Um, so oh, you made all those? Yeah, dude. You know, I go to Canva and get busy. Yeah. So let's see. Full body Italian red wine with flavors of plum and raspberry, notes of green herb, Jamie Tannins, nice acidity, firm. Lingering finish. <laughs> it's a dope wine. This is it's weird. sounds about again, like what I just drank. No, yeah. but again, Refusco, like, you ain't buying this. You know what I mean? Um, no, that's not that's not a varietal you hear. Right, I, you, you just don't hear it until just right now. Yeah, right. I love that though. That's killer. And I can only imagine people that get into the wine club, they find those kind of one-off bottles. And that's good. Yes. I mean, because it, there's so many people out there that deliver the same stuff. You right. know, oh, here's your big Napa cab. Okay, here's your Santa Barbara Pinot Noir. Hey, and there's nothing wrong with them, but it's like... <laughs> 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 Did you guys like great it's lists not, or something talk about things that I wasn't I, aware of before just the podcast? Say, there's some boxes that you know you're going to check. I get, We can put it that way. Okay. Um, but before we move on to the big one, while we enjoy this one, and you guys crush tacos, I crush mine before we hit record again. Um <laughs> All those years um, up in the NFL, traveling, hitting the different markets, things like that. You mentioned that you kind of, you know, you would go out with Woodson and he would be buying wines at dinner and stuff right. like that. What was, when you were on the road, um, whether it was Green Bay, whether it was New York, because I want to ask on the road, because especially in New York, that's an unfair advantage being right in near New York City to be able to experience all the restaurants there. What was your favorite market to travel to? Like, who were some of the franchises that you're like, all right, we got a road game. We're away there this weekend. Ooh, but at least it's like. I love going there. Gosh, let's see. It was hard because like we didn't have like much time, but like my favorite place to go to was, yeah. was Chicago by far. Like even just as a non NFL player, like just Chicago's top two favorite cities in in the U.S. I like going to, especially like now Chicago is is nuts. Like speaking oh, of yeah. unfair advantage, like the restaurant scene is crazy and the wine scene is nuts out there. But love Chicago, and Minnesota was cool. Like Minneapolis was was a good time. That's a yep. fun town. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was. I mean, we we had a we had one crazy night when we went there because um, Minnesota is a short trip, so we had a lot of time to hang out. So we went to this restaurant called Seven. It was all the defensive backs, I mean, maybe like four or five of us, and so we kept our suits on. It's a nice restaurant. We went, got real fancy. Charles ordered a bunch of wine, um, but we still had like we still had like two hours to like kill so we're like let's just get more wine so we still had an hour and a half to kill so we got more wine so i know at this point i'm like all right this is getting a little sketchy here <laughs> and so i remember we heard music upstairs they had, a, they had a lounge and so we found out that there's a lounge up there and we we went to the lounge so i'm like all right you know i'm with charles like we'll be fine we won't get in trouble and then charles he starts ordering patron and I'm like, dude, we got a game tomorrow. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm thinking like, and this, but I learned a lesson. Like, don't hang out with the veterans when you're young because they just have a they have a different way of doing things. Like, some guys can go out all night, go crazy, and then wake up tomorrow and just have a killer game. So, we have more tequila, we have more wine, and now at this point, like, I'm I'm cooked, right? <laughs> I'm absolutely cooked. So we go back to the hotel for our team meeting, and I'm just so nervous, trying not to talk to anybody because I know I reek, you know, and. I get my pregame meal, go up on my night snack. I go upstairs, watch the rest of the games, go to bed. Get the next morning, totally hungover, ruined. Ugh. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be embarrassing. Like, I'm going to go out there and, and play like absolute garbage. And so I do all the things that we have uh, available. That's the cool thing about being in the NFL is like, if I need to hydrate now, I have something to hydrate right now. <laughs> <laughs> something hurts, I can fix it right now. Like, everything is like right now so I can play. And so I did the whole iv i did the salt tablet i did everything imaginable to get myself right and i got myself to a point where i was like okay i feel decent to where i was like i won't maybe i won't be at my best but i still feel okay so I, we start the game i remember charles woodson had an interception immediately and i'm like well that's charles like he's all pro about to be a hall of famer like killing it and then tremont williams who was with us he was an up-and-coming rising star he had an interception he was with us that night and then our other safety, Nick Collins, had an interception, a pick six for a touchdown. Who was under center for Minnesota? 
Gus Farad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, be nice to Gus. <laughs> be nice to Gus. And so, yeah, he's throwing these picks. But here's, I'll tell you what's funny at the end. And then these are all the guys I went out with. And I'm like, yo, these guys are crushing it. And so I'm thinking like, something got to happen for me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like praying like something happens. And then I remember I get this line drive punt, re- punt kicked to me because I was the punt return that team. And I end up taking it to the crib like 76 yards and I scored. And I remember we go to the sideline. We're like, yo, this is nuts. Like, we all went out <laughs> last night and we all made plays. The kicker is uh, we lost that game. Despite no way. <laughs> despite having all those turnovers and touchdowns. <laughs> not offensive. Uh, but that was that was funny because that was um, in- interesting. Now, I will say this. I did not get wasted every night before games now. now but I, w- I did start having maybe a glass before bed. Mm-hmm. That's kind of when that started. So, it became a thing. Like, I would get my pre my you know, Pre day snack whatever and everyone's like oh so what do we what's on the menu tonight you know what are we having tonight and I'm like oh you know San Giovese is tonight like okay cool so everyone knew like I got into a wine game then so yeah. um that was funny so Minneapolis always stands out to me when it comes to that and Chicago was huge but there was we were always able to find a, a scene wherever it was even in Green Bay and um stuff like that but yeah those two it's funny you mentioned New York I never went into the city. It was because it was such a, I was so afraid to like be late or not make it back in time. It was, yeah, get lost you know, wandering around yeah, and it looks the same. No, or just driving around or whatever. Just, it was, it was such a pain to go there. Cause I actually signed with the Giants mid season. So for me, it was just a matter of, let me just make sure I'm on time and I get to places. Cause it's the Rangers and the Knicks to get the unfair advantage. Yes. Yeah, they're, 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 they're right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. No question. Cause we're in Jersey, you know? So but yeah, those, and then actually I would say this Jacksonville, when I lived there, that was, that was a cool, um, food scene too. Actually, I got heavy in the whiskey there. Yeah. I they had see a, that. Yeah. They had a place called whiskey Jacks there. And, and my father actually lived in Jacksonville for a little bit, uh, at the same time as myself. And we stayed at this place all night and did a full on whiskey tasting. So I got, I got pretty into that. So that was cool. You gotta be careful asking me questions. I got stories for days. Dude. <laughs> I, t- I believe that. I know. No, it's awesome they, they you know they ask you a question you're like oh dude i have all this you know <laughs> got all these stories to talk about that one particular thing yeah man. i just want to know where adam Schefter gets all his information he must have so many group texts going he's on the phone all day <laughs> yeah. so i did want to ask you you win the super bowl how old were you when you did that i was just getting started in life at 27 i really didn't know i was just figuring out what i was gonna do that's how it you is, won a though. super bowl what was that like for you like you're going into the game. What is your yeah? When the Super process? Bowl was, it was honestly uh, like a movie, like a dream. Because as I mentioned earlier, were you were you, uh, were you already with your wife at that point? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's and, and our son was born. Yep. Nice. Um, die. I was diehard football, so I never missed a Super Bowl. Never missed it. Never missed not one watching it with my dad. Um, just rewatch him. Grew up just imagining what it was like to like. See the guys with their sons and their wives and their dads yeah, yeah, yeah. just celebrating that stuff. That's awesome. So for that to happen was just outstanding, man. Especially the year before, I get released from the Packers and they win the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Oh, which right. oh, that was yeah horrible because I was there for the process when Mike McCarthy was hired and he built that team ready to go win and they won and I was like not there, sucked. So to come back the next year and win that was just. Yeah, there's there's no feeling like it ever, 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 ever. I believe it. Yeah. I mean, do you just watch Super Bowls now and like takes you right back to? Yeah, I watch them and it's like, man, it's cool because like I know what it's like. You know, well, you've got to have such a different perspective because not only did you play in the league, but you have also experienced that game, that moment, you know, that halftime, everything else. You right. know what goes into that. Right. I mean, with Super Bowl coming up again, depending on when people watch this episode, it may have already passed, but this is going to come out before that. What are some things about not just the Super Bowl, but I guess the NFL itself that like common spectators may not get about? It? I mean, we show up. I mean, it's Sunday religion for me. I mean, NFL Sunday, that's like my church. Right. You show up, all your boys show up, your friends, dog got jerseys on, everybody's chilling. Mm-hmm. You lived it. Right. So, like, Super Bowl in general, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Let's say yeah Super well, Bowl. it's the hardest thing is that is just keeping perspective on the game. Yeah. Because the championship game happens two weeks prior. So you have a full week, you know, to get ready, prepare, but also that full week to handle all the logistics, you know, of, you know, the tickets and, and the travel and your family and all these things. And, and this week, it's a normal week because 
you have you have to get all your preparation done that week because once you travel to the Super Bowl destination, it's all media stuff. And then also too, you're not trying to have aggressive practice where guys get hurt. You have limited time. It's it's all these all these so many so many. And I hate calling them distractions. There's just so many things going on that have nothing to do with the preparation that can get into the way so like it's, football mardi gras yeah. yeah so it's a matter of just trying to keep that perspective um make sure you're you're still preparing make sure you're still getting rest make sure you're still doing these things you're not wearing yourself thin. you're not stressing out about anything else outside you know because at then at the time right we had a you know one-year-old son um and my, my family came out so that's the hardest thing because then once you get to the game you know it's go time even that even the game warming up on the sideline, there's 300 people on the sideline. Like it's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's, you see everybody and it's all like, you literally, it's like closed in cage of like just tons of people where regular game is just the players and maybe some guests, you know, from the suites that come down. Um, so it's just, it's so much, but then finally when kickoff happens, like it is about the game. Tunnel vision. And yeah. Yeah. yeah it is about the game. Yeah. Halftime is longer. Um, there's a lot going on, but it's, again, you have to find a way to just keep it about football. Now, fortunately, I would, you know, the team I was on the giants, they did it, you know, four years prior, um, when they beat the Patriots, the undefeated team. So they already knew how to go, how to handle it when it, when it came to that situation. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that was, that was cool, man. I mean, is it intimidating, you know, especially playing in the Super Bowl, a massive stadium filled with however many thousands of people, right. millions of people are watching you on TV. You know that, like, right. I, I is that even playing about, Where, where was this played at? Indianapolis. That's right. It was yeah. Indianapolis. Okay. Are you even thinking about these people up there? Like, Yeah, I mean, I I was big on just embracing, embracing it, you know? I know for some people it works like I need to block this out. I need to cut this. I need to not look at this. Eliminate distractions. I was I was big on embracing it. Like I love going to again, I love the arena, right? I love going there and seeing all the people. I love seeing all this stuff. I love hearing the boos. I love hearing the cheers. I love hearing people on the sideline talking smack. Like it was I loved all the stuff that came with it. So for me, I think the only time I was kind of like, damn, this is crazy when during pregame when the sideline was packed with people. Um, but no, no, I didn't. Cause then once you're playing, you're playing. Yep. You know, once you're playing, you're playing. Like again, I, I returned punts. Like that was what I did predominantly in the, f the first half of my career. Um, and then I was able to get into certain zones. Like the ball was kicked in the air, in the air. I was able to like not hear anything and just focus on that part. But no, I, I loved everything about it. It reminds me of people are like, man, how do you deal with, you know, constant criticism especially like via social media you know you make one bad play you're gonna get absolutely blasted for weeks and weeks and weeks and i'm like it's, it's part of it that's as part of it like that's just it's, it's, it's the whole deal and i i embrace it i laugh at it it, it is what it is yeah you know if i took everything <laughs> if i took everything personal then i i would have a big issue you know but for me i'm like that's just what they what they think a lot of fans are, you know are irrational you know they're in the moment they represent their team and they do things, they say stuff. It is what it is. So I laugh a lot. Like me on social media, I laugh a lot about your stuff. I am I don't take anything serious. I have I have fun on there. <laughs> yeah, but I, I yeah, and I, but I, I enjoy it. Live. And I I have fun and I and I get it. They're just passionate people, man, and, and I have fun with that. So it's I I think it's great. You know, uh, I grew up in an environment where everybody made fun of each other, everyone messed with each other. If you didn't have thick skin, like, good luck. Yeah, That's how I knew my friends East liked Coast. me when they gave me shit. My friends <laughs> yeah. didn't give me shit. I'm like, oh, they're mad at me, dude. I yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So it was it was rad. Awesome. Nice. All right, want to move on to the cab? Yeah. yeah. All right. I did have one question, too, uh, before we drop the cams. When you, they're doing the half ball, the halftime show, right, at the Super Bowl. Everybody's there for a show. show. They're drinking beer, eating hot dogs, whatever. You guys are there to play the game and, you know, spill blood, yeah. so to speak. What did you guys do? During the halftime show, you guys just it was going just halftime into a room for us, just yeah. normal. That'd typical. be funny if we like went out there and sat on the field, crisscross, <laughs> crisscross applesauce and watched. It was it Madonna? I think it was Madonna that did a halftime I think show. Yours yeah. is Madonna. Yeah, nah, I just knew it was long as heck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the most recent one. It was Rihanna before everybody realized she was pregnant. I can imagine coming out for that one. I'd be like, "Yo, coach, I gotta go real quick." <laughs> she understand. And then you should see pregnant right back. Like, yeah, for no, it, was just, it was just super long. But I just remember. It's funny. I'm like, I'm big into cigars now. Like, I'm a big cigar guy, and I was like, damn, like 
there were two times where I didn't have a cigar. I wish I did. And one of them was the Super Bowl. Like that's oh, when, that's when you yeah. have a cigar. That's for sure, you got to tell. Yeah, that. And, and, and my in my wedding, I didn't have a cigar because I was so like, I'm not touching cigars. Like no, nothing. And I'm like, man, what am I? I should have had a cigar. I probably still be playing by a cigar. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. I just remember like afterwards, you know, I'm trying to uh, go to my locker so I can change and go like see my family again. And like people are right in my locker. I'm like, yo, can you guys like? Move. I've got shit to do. Can you please? Yeah, move? I was, and it, it was Seal. It was Seal and Heidi Klum that I'm telling them to move. They were, they were in our locker room. I know because like, all the celebrities came into our locker room afterwards, and it was them two. Like I'm like, who are these people? I'm like, oh, can you move? And I was like, oh, hey, can you please? Hey, move? Can you move with a smile this time? But no, still. oh yeah, I'll, I'll just reach through. But anyhow, that was funny. Pardon me, Miss Klum. <laughs> So yeah, so we got Dolomite States here. We got the Napa Cab. It's always a Napa Cab. It's <laughs> yeah. a, if you're ever playing wine bingo and Napa Cab is an option, just pick it. Just say Napa Cab. Yeah. <laughs> so very cool. Oh wait, let me get my Napa Cab notes here. Oh yeah, let's see. What notes of dark fruit, blackberry. Look at that. Exactly. You know. So, um, stag leaps. Let's do it. Uh, obviously, yep. Dark fruit, graphite. Called it. Firm tan. <laughs> you read the you read the cards earlier. I know it. He knows wine. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, Napa, right fruit, high alcohol. Let's go. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a Napa cab through and through. Yep. I like that. Standard. Well, we record this podcast here in Orange County, California. Um, obviously, the land of, not that other places don't have great tacos, as people have heard in past episodes, but this is the land of plenty when it comes to great Mexican food. We're wow. also, I mean, the land, other states. Again, pop quiz, how many states in the U.S. make wine? All of them. <laughs> yep. A lot of people don't know that. Every state does. Uh, but this is California. I mean, come on. We crush it. We've got it's the North North Coast. We got Napa. We got Temecula. We got, you know, inland counties. We got Santa Barbara. Do you, as somebody who's now, obviously your roots are here now, your family's here now, you guys are here. Do you have a favorite region or do you have a place that you really kind of like to go to or escape off to? You know what? I like, I like them both. No, I just, I love... I love Napa how it feels, you know, obviously great wines. Like everyone, honestly, everyone in Napa makes good wine. I was going to say that right now. There's some that do better than others, but it's hard to find bad wine in Napa. But I just love just the area. Like I would get a place there if I could. Um, but we, we did something interesting for our anniversary. We went to Temecula and obviously to take Temecula to the wine community, like the, I don't know, the condescending wine community, and they, they cringe, like, oh, Temecula, awful wines, don't know what they're doing, that place is terrible, you just go there to have a good time, and go to Wilson's Creek and party. So, we went to Temecula, and we spent, you know, a few days there, because I was like, you know what, for me, like, if someone's like, you know, someone so he's not a good person, whatever, let me find it for myself. You know, <laughs> like my relationships and my relationships because of how I am yeah. to them. Um, I get along, personally, I get along with a lot of misfits, a lot of crazy people. Like, we get along because I feel like they're misunderstood. You know, there was a point in time where they, whatever. So we go there and I go, I just go around to all these wineries and I'm like, give me the real. Like, I really want to learn about this place and understand why this place has this reputation. And we went to... Uh, Palumbo winery there mm -hmm. and he, he got into the history just how you know early you know back then a bunch of like movie producers bought the wineries set up shop there and just literally made it a party place meaning no attention to the wine let's just make wine to give to these people but this is what what here to have fun so there was no true i guess viticulture going into the wine you know from what i've heard and it wasn't until maybe like 20 years ago where people started finally trying to make good wines. So like probably even less than that. Yeah. Maybe, yeah I, was, maybe, I think like 14 is like yeah. the, a good vintage for a Temecula, you know? So for example, like these producers were having fun. They look at the books like, Hey, we should probably make up, make our wines better. Like no need. People are still buying it again from the experience. Right. right? We had good at this place. So let's buy the wine. Even the finals weren't good. So it wasn't so recently where they started finally getting into it, finding like the, you know, treating the soil properly and getting the right yeast and good wine practices. And there are some good places like Palumbo winery was cool. We went to Akash, which was really fun. Yeah, Akash is dope. Um, 
We method, uh, you mentioned uh, Champagne Method was. I know Carter Estate does that out Carter, there. Yeah, Carter. We actually rode horses at Carter. Yeah. yeah. The guys over at Ween's have some crazy exactly. Italian varietals like Fiano and yeah. stuff. I mean, there's some really good there's stuff out really there. some really good stuff. And, and, I, and like Italian varietals do well down there. Yeah. Um, because, obviously because of the heat and stuff like that too. But no, we, we it was it was a blast. And I really got to like learn about the people. That's why I say like go to wine places to like really get the full experience and just to learn about it. Cause there are some passionate people cause Palumbo is cool because he is, he's always challenging the system. You know, he was like, look, like, let's try to build this community up. Like he's a big, big pioneer in that. So that was a cool experience for me. Um, obviously like love Paso, um, love Santa Barbara, you know, speaking to like California. So I love, I just like going to places and learning about them. Like I don't have a favorite. Obviously, m all my connections are in Napa. So when I go up there, I, we have a, a good time. So it's good. Yeah, I like I like everywhere. I like a good time. I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of where I stay. <laughs> yeah. I like a good time. Yeah, that man. period. Yeah, let's just Wherever have, I can find that, that's where I like fun. to be. Let's yeah. just chill out and have fun, man. Yep. So all good, man. Yeah. I'm not normally a big Napa cab, but that's pretty killer. Yeah. See, cabs are the only thing I ever drink. Oh, my wife, she always, she always drinks cabs. That's all so good. That's kind of been my jam recently. All good. Well, I mean, I think as we kind of start to wind this down a little bit. Wind this what down. Do you, what do you, wind this down. Wind let's this down. go. <laughs> Y'all saw what I did there. It was a little cringy, but whatever. <laughs> you got to play the game. No, nah, it's cool. Um, I There's just a religious shirt said Tawar. Oh, yeah. No, I came to play. I was wondering what up. that shirt yeah. was. I had no idea. There you go. Terroir. Mover and Shaker Co. Um, oh, explain to people Terroir. So Terroir is basically when you taste a wine. Let's say this is a Napa Cap. Correct. If we were to taste a Cabernet from France, if we were to taste a Cabernet from New York, if we were to taste a Cabernet from Virginia, it could be the exact same grape picked at the exact same time, exact same bricks, which is the sugar content in the grape, uh, a lot of different things. They're all going to taste different because terroir camera, is your soil, it's your dirt. It's the earth, right? I mean, that's how right, I interpret yeah. it. That's how it's generally explained. Yeah. It's a fun thing to explain yeah. to people. And I must imagine that you have fun in your tastings when yeah. people taste something and they're like, oh, this isn't a big, oaky, buttery Chardonnay. This is crisp, acidic, yeah. different ones. And you get to explain kind of different aspects of it to people. Right. And that's that's the thing. It's It's... Right, everything included. The, yeah, the, the soil, the climate, the asphalt, all that stuff. No, mm -hmm. I love playing that game because um, he was the photographer for America's Next Top Model, Nigel Barker, and I did one of his. He has a pod called Stirs and Shakers that he does, obviously a alcohol pod, and hates buttery oaky Chardonnay. He's like, I hate. No, he goes, I hate Chardonnay. I hate it. It's buttery. It's oaky. It's horrible. I was like, I'm gonna send you Chardonnay. He was like, Don't <laughs> send you Chardonnay. So I sent him wine. And he was like, oh, this is cool. He looked at it and he was like, oh, I, this is really good. I was like, which one you get? He goes, oh, I got the Chablis you sent me. I was like, oh, cool, man. I said, that's Chardonnay. <laughs> he was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yes. I, I played again with everybody because it's, it's how you make it. You know, it's, it's, it depends. Like they're obviously Chablis uh, over there, Burgundy area. It's, you know, not hot like that. And they don't, they stainless steel don't use much oak or any at all. Use malolactic fermentation just to soften the acidity. The cool thing with malolactic fermentation, like lactic, meaning dairy, right? That's where you get the cream and, and, and the, all, all kinds of vanilla notes like that, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so I like playing that game. And, um, but again, terroir is huge. Like, so I was on Psalm TV. I did a blind tasting. Yeah. Yeah. What Master Sommelier, Laura Manic. And I think former Laura Fiavanti. And I thought I was going to only blind taste her. She was going to blind taste. So I was like, I need to find something that's going to like get her because she's elite. She was even studying on the plane to get ready for this when she, before she land. And I was looking hard. I'm like, gosh, she, if I get, she's going to find it. She's going to guess what it is. So I found a Chardonnay from Tasmania, okay. Australia. Yeah. From Tasmania because the Chardonnays there are very similar to Napa Shard based on how they produce it. So when she went through it, her guess was Napa Shard. And I was so, I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. I, was like, I, was, I was like, man, but because I, I knew the terroir, like, okay, yeah. this is, this might throw, cause she's probably thinking like, oh, he's gonna bring uh, something simple, you know? And usually that works. Like Pinot Grigio is the hardest for me to blind taste cause it is nothing. So that's why you gotta trust your gut. When it's nothing, it's nothing, but yeah. But yeah, cool, man.
That's awesome. I love my terroir shirt. Again, I understood. They're like, I'm like, oh shit, Will's coming in. All right, wine. Let's go. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, good, man. Well, if people want to learn more about kind of how to sign up for the club, yeah. kind of follow along with you, I mean, things like that, whether it's kind of social media, websites, emails, right. lists, signups for the club, where can people kind of find all that information at? Yeah, so simple. Just just go to thewinemvp.com. Um, I would love to sign up for the club. We got some fun stuff coming up. Um, but also you can just subscribe to the newsletter and um, you'll get a lot of cool information about like what we do. There's going to be a lot of cool things coming up in 2024. I'm finally going to get into the wine making scene. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to start making our own stuff. Um, not just wine. We're going to get into beer. We're going to get into whiskey. We're going to just go crazy. Oh, so, that's awesome. So, yeah. So this year is going to be a lot of fun, um, like working on that. And then. Uh, we have an event in Super Bowl in Vegas um, at the Heap of Life Center in Vegas. So that's usually cool. So I partner with uh, Culinary Kickoff. So Chrissy Delau is her name. She's also my hospitality coordinator, and it's just a crazy event. You have all the top chefs, um, literally the top chefs from like Food, Food Network that come down, a lot of cool beverage companies, former athletes who have their own companies. So it's a really, really crazy, psychotic fun event in vegas so that's february 8th um fortunately i gotta send out invites you can but if you're on but if you're on in the club then you have you can get access to these events so yeah we can't not ask who do you got for the super bowl who do you, who do you think is going to make it who do you and how much money are we putting on the table you know what's what you know what's hard is that i still have a lot of relationships in the nfl and yeah that's what i knew was going to make like i really hard. i so if i'm, if I'm being personal I really would like either Josh Allen um, to to get one because he is just he's a good buddy of mine. He's a mutant. I would love for him to to get one. Um, but it would be cool for Lamar Jackson and the Ravens to win yeah. one um, just so they could leave him the hell alone. Um, he's he's like so talented. They, would, they always find something. So he's probably going to get MVP this year. And if he gets a Super Bowl, then they can just leave him alone for like the next decade. Yeah. Which would be cool. Um, yeah. That's how I'm feeling. One of them too, Bills or Ravens. Be good. I'd, I'd love to see Bills fans get unleashed in Vegas. There wouldn't be a plastic. There wouldn't no, be a plastic table available. I was gonna miles. say if Bill, <laughs> listen, if Bills, uh, clip this. If Bills Mafia makes it to the Super Bowl, I will elbow drop a table in Vegas in a suit. <laughs> you heard it here, okay? You Macho here. Man, Randy, and I was like, I'm a huge WWF fan. I know it's WWE now. I'm a huge wrestling guy. Like, I grew up. I still have Nintendo 64, and we play. Uh, WC versus NWO or uh, WrestleMania, we we go nuts. Yeah, don't show your wife this episode until after the Super Bowl. She'd be like, "Baby, what'd you agree no to?" Way. Bill <laughs> no way. Also, just like she would love that. <laughs> yeah, no way. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, is there anything uh, we didn't cover? We should have covered anything that we need to. I'm full. I'm happy. We're good. That full was awesome. Happy. Yeah, we'll That's do it. We'll, good we'll, do, we'll do it again. That's what life yeah. was meant to be. That's cool. a cool thing. We'll do it again. So yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Well, uh. Will Blackman, uh, NFL, what is it? What is it? God, I heard this funny slogan. I don't know if it's something you made up or what. It's uh, from football to fine wine. Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah. I like it. I might have butchered that, so my bad, everybody. Cab. Napa cab. It's a cab? Yeah. <laughs> Drink it, right? I'll go line to the vineyard, what do you want to say? <laughs> cheers, guys. Hey, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming in, yeah. man. Pleasure to talk absolutely. to you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Happy Taco Tuesday. Cheers. Have a good one. See you. Taco Tuesday. Yeah.